Hi and hello and welcome to Masters of Divinity. I'm your moderator, JP, and I'm here with Father Chuck. Aloha. Uh, Matt can't be with us uh, because he got coronavirus. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Is that funny? Is that wrong? Is it too soon? Oh, you can't say coronavirus. They'll demonetize you for that. You have to call it the, the COVID-19. They'll monetize you? They'll demonetize you. Why? Advertisers don't want to be associated with coronavirus, so they, they're Oh, that's right. It, that's because uh, they delayed uh, the Bond movie. Is that, does that have anything to do with it? I don't, I don't know. It's that. It's just it's, it's advertisers freaking out. Every, okay. Everyone's freaking out. Yeah, but this it, it's it, it the freaking out in a way that we're like we can't advertise with anyone who mentions it is is is, is a particular kind of funny thing I think is, is okay to laugh at. Um, but yeah, we're we're not monetized, but this is kind of a funny thing. <laughs> so you can't say coronavirus, but like, could you say the words corona and virus in the same sentence? Just to say beer virus, <laughs> the beer virus. <laughs> COVID-19. Yeah, I heard someone describe coronavirus sounds like uh, like, like a dad trying to make a hangover joke. Like, That's kind of funny. Uh, I got mean, the coronavirus. Uh. You see, now, now that joke's going to be made. <laughs> that's going to be dad jokes now. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. That's true. Yeah. I, 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 I fully anticipate, you know, this that's, is probably... That's, it's going to be... Boomer Cinco meme. de Mayo. Yeah. Cinco de Mayo, it will be a boomer meme. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, just place your bets, everybody. Place your bets right now. And if, and if it happens to pop up, I'll post it. I'll post all of them. All of them. All of them. Um, but, yeah, people are people are freaking out this COVID-19. And, uh, yeah, and Matt has it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel well, wrong. Feel kind of, bad if I, yeah, like, does, what if like, that like, happens? Like, what if, I don't know. What if? That'd be bad. <laughs> I don't know. I wanted to make some kind of coronavirus joke at the at the top of this, uh, but I just didn't have it. I just I'm so tired. I'm so tired. <laughs> One thing I will realize: that they keep saying "stop touching your face." And I'm like, buddy, <laughs> it's like asking me to stop blinking. I counted I, the number of times I touched my face. It's like in the hundreds. Well, it's like I, I have a beard. Yeah, it's that so like. Are they that's, saying we should shave? No, because then you shave, you touch it more because, like, you get that's that true. bristly feel, and that's always kind of fun. To, well, it's it's or funny. you get like acne, and so you got to deal with it. Yeah, the whole that's the the whole touching your face thing is really messing with me because today I was driving and I stopped at the stoplight, and as soon as I stopped at the stoplight, I touched my face. I just went, I just went like this, no reason, just like that. Yeah, I was like, oh my god, and then I started looking around, looked at the car next to me. The person was, you know, doing this. I looked at the other car next to me. The person was like, I'm like, we're not going to stop touching our faces here, people. <laughs> well, the thing, here's the thing. Here's the thing. We've been touching our faces our whole lives. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, suddenly, like, I, this is the thing that gets me about, about the whole COVID-19 deal is, like, it, it's, it's not going to just manifest. Yeah. Right? If... It, I don't know. It's just it's just the the fact that like people are like acting like it, it's coming to get me. Like yeah, I don't know. Don't hang out with people who've been to Italy. You'll be fine. <laughs> just wash your hands. Just wash, and wash your hands. Have that Perel ready. You may have to and kill like, someone for it, but it's. <laughs> was it someone? One of the one of the people here in the in my resident life duty team was telling me they saw a thing the other day where they showed comparisons of like in like the certain time frame of the number of people who died. Um, from coronavirus, it was like 130 something or whatever, or like 108 or whatever. It was like that first 108. But within that time frame, they compared it to the number of people who died from snake bites, <laughs> and it was like more people died from snake bites in the same time frame. Wow. You know, so like, it's not stopping people from going to snake places. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. well, anyway, it, it's, it's wash just, your hands. Yeah, wash your hands. Wash your hands. Wash your food. Uh, wash your hands before you prepare your food. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe, maybe don't go to the Golden Corral. Yeah. Those sneeze guards are mostly decorative. Well, and just even in a healthy season, probably you shouldn't go to the Golden Corral. <laughs> okay. So let's get to our actual topic instead of. Yeah, uh, that's that's good because we can't just keep doing things in perpetu- perpetuity. 
or like like trying to say the word perpetuity. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that'll that'll take a long time. So I I just had this, I you know I, I had this. Um, I think a lot about like fandom. I think a lot about fandom properties, um, and uh, also how it sort of relates to us as a culture. And uh, lately, also kind of how, how like what what capitalism has to do with it, you know. Um, and it's it's sort of I I, I like to just kind of just take a step back and sort of observe how we interact with certain areas of pop culture, especially movies and TV shows. And um, and I kind of you, you kind of notice things when you watch when you watch people long enough. And you start to see like the same kind of patterns emerge. And I was watching a, a, a YouTube video as I normally do. YouTube I watch probably more than Netflix these days. Um, but someone made like an hour long video about um, about Batman. And no one's ever done that on the internet. <laughs> it's the first one I've ever seen in my life. Um, which is which is a, it's a joke. Um, <laughs> I got maybe 15 minutes into this video. It was about Batman and gothic horror. And he kind of started bringing up a lot of the same things you always hear fans talk about when it comes to their favorite properties. And they go on for a very long time. Other people take the reins and do their own interpretation. What do they always say? They don't get the character. They don't understand this. They didn't nail this part. And I'm like, where does this all come from? Because I'm getting... There was a time when I was like, I used to say this a lot. I probably said this, said it on this podcast. Um, but I feel like I'm, I'm getting to an age where like, A, that criticism is not very interesting to me anymore. B, like, what does it mean? You know? Like... And, and and I started just to kind of dwell on this. Like, they don't get the character. They don't get the character. And what I really broke is when they did to, about, like, Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi. I'm like, first of all, yes, they do get the character. Um, but it kind of made me realize that, like, the whole reason that we deal with this sort of... Um, not just that one argument. That's just one one idea, one one example. The totality of all of the usual fanboy arguments, of audience arguments, the really surface level arguments that we don't really care about, but everyone just kind of regurgitates over and over again. I think the sole reason why it keeps happening is because they're about properties that just don't end. Yeah. And, um, I th- well, I, well, I mean, just like, for instance, the argument about not getting Batman as a character. Right. He has had like what 75, 76, 77 years of history. Oh, I know. At this point, yeah. So, I mean, what what do you mean when you say that? Like, I get because I, I, I know this is a question you just asked. They were like, arguing about Grant Morrison's run on Batman and his take on Gotham when he made it like less gothic and less dark. So, would they say that Adam West, that the Adam West Batman, didn't get Batman? Well, he, he did sort of make the argument that Batman became more definitive once they embraced the, the darker side of it, like in the 80s, once like Frank Miller came around. with right, because they all worship Frank Miller. Exactly. It, yeah. then, then it was kind of, at the beginning, it was sort of a big love letter to Frank Miller and his vision of Batman, yeah. Yeah, it's it always is. the Because <laughs> the, the thing is, is um, like, as somebody who, 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 who's, who, who does like Batman, um, is... <sighs> A character that's had that kind of history, there are so many iterations and so many takes on the character Mm -hmm. that all highlight different aspects of it. So what the Adam West Batman highlights is the sheer ludicrousness Mm -hmm. of a man who dresses up like a bat with a young man as his sidekick who's in short pants and a yellow cape fighting these colorful, this colorful rogues gallery of, of characters so it gets that. Yeah. But there's also like 1989 term Tim Burton Batman film went into the idea that, oh, if this if, if a, like 
if a guy witnesses, if a billionaire witnesses parents murder right in front of him when he was a child, like, and he never really like heals from that, he's going to have a pretty messed up psyche. And that might lead him to do something nuts, like dress up like a bat yeah, and all that. So, so like that also gets the character, but it highlights it in different ways. And you know, like the I love the I love the Neil Adams run of Batman in the seventies where oh, he yeah. he's my favorite. Where he's, you know, driving like a muscle car hot rod, which the new Batmobile is clearly drawing from that, totally. that, that era, by the way. I love it. I love the new Batmobile, by the way. It's awesome. It is awesome. <laughs> um it's an IRC. And yeah, the idea like the idea that a that a you know a young a young billionaire would get a custom hot rod to be his crime fighting vehicle like that. That's a total real. That's a, that's a total again, getting the character. So yeah, I get you on the sense that, that, that statement doesn't make any sense, especially with a character who's been around as long as Batman and that there's really no way to ever truly get the character because like you said, there is no ending to him. Mm -hmm. Um, to fully get a character, you kind of have to know where they end. Yeah. And maybe that's why people said, what they said about Luke Skywalker is they didn't want his story to end. And that's why they think that he should have lived on in perpetuity. Right. Yeah. Which is why we get a ghost version of him. <laughs> in Rise of Skywalker, man. Have you have a quick, quick tangent? Have you seen like the stuff that's been popping up? I guess it's kind of like a slow movie news month. You're talking well, yeah, because of the COVID nineteen, nobody's going to the movies. You're talking about you're talking about the, uh, the, the all the stuff about like the novelization that's come out. Yeah, about like, Palpatine, like the uh, like uh, yeah, Ray's yeah. dad being a failed Palpatine clone. Yes. Uh, what else was there? There's another one that I saw circulating. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's it's I, it's I'm basically become insane. it's basically become Pottermore. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. But like, but not for like how the story continues. Yeah. But rather for BS that was happening between the sentences. Or well, yeah, whatever. yeah, exactly. But, but to give it to its credit, it's not as insane as J.K. Rowling's uh, weird things that she would just pop up with, like oh, make her stop, <laughs> you know. Uh, but still, kind of annoying. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but as you're saying, this is because things don't end. Yeah, I do think it is because things don't end. I think I think that. Um, I think that when, when something kind of goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on, and you're just sort of already kind of made the decision to kind of devote yourself to it, I feel like you're, you're not engaging with that media or that art as a way to kind of like, you know, as just sort of like a fun way to maybe look at the, look at the world, to learn something, to enrich one's life. Maybe you're just using it to kind of escape the world. It becomes part of your identity, um, and you kind of at, at that point the quality of the storytelling doesn't quite matter so much as familiarity. Mm-hmm. And so once that familiarity gets disrupted, which is inevitable because these things are going to go on to the day we die, you get mad, and you start saying dumb things about Star Trek Picard. <laughs> Are there people saying dumb things about Star Trek Picard? Yes. Of course there are. Never mind. Of course there are. <laughs> Side note, I started watching Discovery. We can talk about that later. Okay. Um, um, I, um, uh, actually, let's talk, uh, let me talk about Discovery. Okay. All right. Because, uh, you know, there are so many people who talk about it as, as, as it's garbage. There's a garbage show and it's bad and it doesn't get Star Trek. It's, it's garbage Star Trek. Right. I've realized that I'm like Father Fun, guest of the show, a mm-hmm. uh, friend of the show, I should say, um, in that I'm predisposed to like anything Star Trek simply by the fact that it's called Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, and, I think they would call it being a fan. Yeah. Yeah. And with Discovery, like the only thing that irritates me with Discovery is I, I'm just sort of bugged that they redesigned the Klingons again. Mm hmm. Like that, and that's my little just pedant, pedantic thing is that like that you're dealing with an area that with an era of the franchise that has kind of pretty pretty much solidly established what was going on with the Klingons at that time frame, right? And you just sort of ignored it because Brian Fuller was like, "I just want the Klingons to look different," and that's that's a little it, 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 it's irritating, but mm-hmm. at the same time, I get it. 
because every, almost, so many iterations of Star Trek have updated the Klingons and we can just sort of move on because these are fictional things and so what? The Klingons don't have curly hair. Okay. Like, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. Whatever. Um, so like, what? so uh, the point I'm getting at is I feel, I feel like I'm in a place where I can appreciate things that I really love when they do things that seem out of sync with what I'm supposed to feel about them. Okay. You know, because I think part of the issue, and I've, and I've realized, okay, and, and talking about, let's talk about Picard for a moment, because we, I've, I've watched more of that. And actually, there's a new episode I need to watch. Oh, yeah, I know. Me too. Um, um, is my thing with Picard is that at, when I first watch it, I was like, oh, this is so try hard. Like, it feels like it's trying to be cool. And I read an article mm-hmm. talking about that, you know, Star Trek, this is Star Trek trying to be cool. And Star Trek doesn't really work when Star Trek tries to be cool. But then I started, but then because I like the, uh, every episode I watch, I get my little Picard fix. I'm like, I want to watch more Picard. And so I, I, I'll watch a rerun of Next Generation. I started, I started watching reruns of Next Generation that fit, that I know the episodes fit in thematically with what they're doing with Picard. And I realized the big issue, and I think the big issue that people have with it is that the cinematography is just so different. Oh, if yeah. you did that same show on a set, like a, do it like a multi-camera set, Mm-hmm. You know, like if you shot it just like the old Star Trek show, yeah, I don't think people would be as bugged by it. No, no, I at think all. the fact that it's, I think it's the cinematography that it, it, you know, likewise, if they were to like revisit the sets of Next Generation and shoot it this way, I think people might be a little bit like, oh, okay, this is what it would look like if it were shot that way. Yeah, it, it's it's a, a you know, it's different in that the the overall aesthetic is different in that. The, the like the costume designing is way more cash than next generation yeah. was next generation was all like tunics and <laughs> weird cult clothing really yeah. um uh this one you know Picard's hanging out like in a t-shirt and stuff you know yeah uh, and he wears like a panama suit come on yeah and like the, the romulans are like in cargo pants you know like it's a bit more relaxed it's a bit more modern um but yeah i think you're right yeah. about that as well uh but go ahead finish what you're gonna say Anyway, I just what so what gets me is, I, I, whenever I hear, whenever I see people complain about these things, I, I, my my first question is like, well, what do you want? Mm-hmm. Like, what are you wanting out of this? Are you really wanting it to be the same exact thing? Yes, <laughs> I think I think I think they do. Like I, I mean, said, I guess I think it, it's the familiarity. You yeah, know? I mean, it's like what they did with Star Wars. Which is, what was the first thing they said that they were going to do to Star Wars when they announced that The Force Awakens was being made? That it's going to look like the, the old trilogy, right? Mm, right and it does. Right, right. It, it's spitting image. It's that used aesthetic. None of that Phantom Menace, you know, handcrafted stuff that we all hated, which I came to appreciate these past couple of years. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's that's actually kind of, like, I was excited about that too. Like, oh, it's going to look more like how I... Remember, Star Wars is going to have the old, you know, uh, used universe look. Well, and practical effects. Right. And more tactic, more tactical, uh, not tactical, tactile. tactile looking sort of texture and stuff, which I think I right. think Abrams is really good at capturing. Um, and that's all good and well. Uh, but, you know, in retrospect, like maybe we should have let it grow. You know, like w- w- what does like a Star Wars in a Renaissance era look like? But nobody wants that. <laughs> you know, nobody wants to speculate uh, and 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 think creatively outside the box uh you know they want what they grew up with they want the the yeah. you know mom's mom's uh, potato pie I don't, I don't know well and they want they want <laughs> i mean i think it's it does seem like people want um where was i going with this I don't remember where I was going to go with this. Um, well, I'll just say, familiar, uh, but... uh, okay. I'll I'll just I'll just yeah. say, I don't think it's realistic to do that because you will eventually get bored of it. You instead of a satisfying instead of leaving something because of a satisfying fulfilling ending, you're going to leave it because it's it's just exhausting you. You know what it is. What. 
it's it's sort of like it's sort of like trying to be vegan but wanting everything to taste like meat yeah at some point when you make huh that's an interesting way of putting it yeah because you know like you know if yeah because i mean the well, i mean like for instance like you know there's this whole thing about the impossible burger you know at, at burger king which is I, I enjoy it i think it's very good um i think it's awesome that burger king is offering a alternative you know plant alternative burger the reason you eat that is not because you're trying to be healthy right you eat that because you actually care about the planet and you want to see less meat being used Mm -hmm. because in terms of health it's exactly like nutritionally it's not that far different from eating a beef burger like still got the sodium still got all that stuff in it um you know maybe maybe it's less fat or whatever but nutritionally it's not that different so it's not like it's not like really that healthier in you know in a sense um and so I think because I think what happens is is like so what we want is we want something new but we want that new thing to somehow taste like the old thing right yeah and so I think we saw that with like the force awakens in the sense that you know beat by beat it's it's a very similar film to a new hope Mm -hmm. but it's just with new new characters right so it's the same thing, but with new characters. Mm. So again, it's it's new, but it tastes the same, right? And um, the Force Awakens is like a, you know, I remember first watching it and loving it and thinking it's just kind of like a very precious movie. <laughs> you like, it's 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 delightful because that's what J.J. Abrams was was hoping for. But there wasn't, I mean, think back to like when people saw the first Star Wars, like when Han Solo suddenly appeared at the end of the trench, Death Star trench, like how nuts people probably went. Mm-hmm. There's really nothing like that in Thor: Wars Awakens, right? You know, there's there's cool moments, but there's nothing like out of the blue that's like super creative, like you didn't see coming. Holy crap! Wow, that's amazing. Um, and even and they they kind of tried to, and they also kind of tried to be kind of shocking by killing off Han Solo. But I think when, when that happened, my theater was just like completely silent and like not. People didn't really care. <laughs> like I don't think people. I don't know. I don't know if that's like a failing in J.J. Abrams is part of or like uh, whatever. Uh, well, I think part of it, though, you have to you have to keep in mind, though, when when, you know, you you saw that movie, what, like 20 times opening day. I know. Um, <laughs> I wanted to die. I wanted to but die. You have to, but you have to remember, you know, that if you saw that first showing, you were seeing it with Star Wars fans. Yeah. yeah. And most Star Wars fans, I would think, knew that Harrison Ford really wanted Han Solo to die a That's long true. time ago. That's true. And so it was more, I think it was for me when I saw it, I, I thought it was more of like a, oh, he finally got what he wanted. Like, I, <laughs> yeah. I just sort of, I kind of went into the movie knowing like, he's going to die in this. Yeah, that's probably true. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and so I think it was more like, okay, that ha- that finally happened. Um, I will say, in our undying love of The Last Jedi, that happens on this podcast, <laughs> The Last Jedi actively tried to do new and surprising things oh yeah totally mm-hmm. there may not have been a han solo saving luke skywalker in the death star trench scene but like that whole movie was still like for me like an emotional roller coaster mm-hmm. like a, oh, well i mean I'm, what am i saying like the, the scene where kylo ren kills snoke and then they join forces to take on the mm-hmm. praetorian guard i lost it uh, so maybe I'm maybe I'm, I'm I'm wrong. Maybe that's as close as we can get. Yeah. Well, and I I also think I think Luke showing up at the end. Oh yeah. That was you cool. know he he honestly if you think about it, Luke sort of fits the Han Solo bit. Oh yeah. He's sort of like being like Han Solo in that moment because you think that he's given up, but he actually right. he actually shows up at the end to save the day. Right. But but back back to the yeah larger point. <laughs> um. I, I still think that um, I don't know I don't know what the point I was trying to make before we started talking a lot about Star Wars, which happens. <laughs> yeah. Well, was, well, you were talking about like the importance of endings, I guess. Yeah, I, I I feel like a story a story needs to end. Right. A story. I think the relationship with a with a work of art or with uh, a story, there needs you need to put it away after feeling satisfied, you know, like a meal. Mm-hmm. And I know like comparing art to food is lazy, and I, but I always end up doing it. Um, but food is art. <laughs> okay. Cooking is art. 
And that's that's kind of the funny thing about Star Wars. The Star Wars had an ending. And people were somewhat satisfied. They were satisfied as a whole that we have these like three movies that we can love and cherish for all the time. And then like the EU happened, and then the prequels happened, and now Disney, and now it's like they're saying it's go, oh, they're gonna we're gonna make Star Wars to the end of time. Now it's like you know, when when do I I don't I don't understand. Like I, I, I don't um Am I just supposed to love Star Wars? Am I supposed to grow out of it? And while it keeps going on, um, when do I check out? <laughs> like when? Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, a case could be made that Star Wars is better when it was just three movies. Yeah, probably. Um, I hear that I, debate. Yeah, it's you know, it's not like you know, I, I guess probably one of the first like multimedia franchises that that sort of cap kicked this off. Honestly, is probably Star Trek. Yeah, in a way, in the in the Doctor idea Who. that, well, yeah, th- I mean, yeah, though Doctor Who, Doctor Who actually started as a sort of a creative way to teach like science and math and stuff. Yeah, and then it just turned into its own thing. But I think that, like, you know, Star Trek was one of these things that really built into this, like, a, at least for a TV and movie type thing, like cross media deal, to really give you a universe to inhabit. And so there's like lots of corners in that universe that you can explore. And, you know, there are other stories that can be told within that. It's not just the story of Kirk and the crew. It, yeah. You know, there are other things that can go on. Um, and then Star Wars, of course, did that with the, with with their expanded universe a little bit. But now everything is this. Mm-hmm. And I, I, the, to me, the, the interesting thing I think will be to watch is what happens with Marvel. Yeah. Because we got a very, we got a very nice ending with Endgame mm-hmm. that capped off. And I honestly, I'm like, I'm done. I, I don't. Oh, me too. I don't need I mean, to go. Black see Widow it. looks kind of cool, but does it? I, I, I have no interest. I like it. I, I just, I like, I like it when Marvel does spy stuff. That's just me. Yeah, like, I mean, I might check it out when it comes on Disney Plus, but I'm not. I don't <laughs> yeah. know that I'm gonna go to theater and see it. And I, and I honestly don't think I, I I'd be surprised if people go mm-hmm. um, yeah i'd be surprised about that too i mean i'd be surprised when most of these things come out like what it's going to be like i mean but, inevitably right there's gonna inevitably we're probably gonna learn that natasha didn't die in the snap or something and therefore like it's course. gonna yeah it's just gonna repeat yeah. comics like what, what comics do right well and that's, and that's what they do but i kind of like the idea though that this massive movie series had an ending mm-hmm. and like let's sit with that yeah just let that be. I don't need it, because more. Like, it's if you so, want to continue it on TV, okay, that's fine. But like, and I think that, I think what's happening. It, it's so antithetical to the behavior to like nerd behavior, right? Because mm-hmm. everything nerds love go on forever, and and that begins with comic books, which have been going on for eons at this point, right? right? Um, if they ended, probably have a heart attack. <laughs> um, but, and I think that's the the and the. Uh, and and how and how nerd culture was appropriated and turned mainstream that that uh way that companies sort of tap into nerd behavior has gotten mainstream too that which is why you're going to be making Star Wars at the end of time and now yeah. at this point it looks like Star Trek might be that too mm-hmm. uh, which i mean it always kind of was but now it's like oh it's it's jumping on now and they got some money to throw up on the screen this time um you know what? It, it's I, I realize one topic and, we haven't. And, really... and, I mean, and, oh. and, sorry, sorry. One, one, one yeah, more point. It's fine. And yeah. you know what were we, what were you and I just talking about? The next Batmobile, right? right. Another Batman iteration. When are they going to? Yeah. Will they ever stop making Batman movies? Are they ever going to stop making James Bond movies? Like, when does it end? Right. Yeah, I was going to say one thing we 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 haven't touched on at all, and it's just because it's completely out of our wheelhouse being of our demographic but it's soap operas oh yeah they probably do it right you know, you know what i mean because they change they change they make so many i mean soap operas are known for being for last forever but they're also known for making like super drastic changes and people just go with it <laughs> you know you know honestly who i kind of think what i think is is probably doing it right yeah power rangers probably <laughs> because i mean think about it right because it, it every iteration has its jump on jump off point and it sort of speaks to a different generation right like we grew up with you know we grew up with the dinosaur you know power rangers mighty right. morphin power rangers the original right but like there are there are kids that for them it was like power rangers turbo or power rangers space and you know 
all those different iterations that I didn't know about until I watched the um, until the, the the toys that made us episode about Power Rangers. Oh yeah, and and to find out, you know, you've got you've got you know the generations to where it you know different different shows you know meant different things to them. But how's the thing Power Rangers sort of cast yeah. all of that, and it kind of hits that Japanese. It, it's kind of like anime in that regard. Anime does right. that right with like Gundam. The Gundam series goes on forever, but each Gundam series has its own sort of self-contained thing. You don't necessarily need to watch the other ones to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think what's, what's sort of unique about Power Rangers, and I don't know if it's on purpose or not, but like, I think once you reach a certain age of Power Rangers, you're like, I could put this behind me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Batman, Batman, you can't do Batman. People don't really do that. Star Wars, uh, you know, Marvel. Well, the question comes, you know, maybe we should. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe we ought to start, you know, putting away childish things as the Bible says. I think of something that Alan Moore said, um, legendary comic book writer and occultist. (laughs) Yeah. Our, our favorite wizard, our favorite comic book uh, writer and wizard deal with it. Grant Morrison. Um, he's, he's a rival wizard. Everyone knows Uh, Alan Moore won, but is, uh, is, um, he was the one who pointed out that these comic book stories need an ending. Yeah, and that's what he, he made that 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 Superman story, right? Whatever happened to the man? Yeah, well, Tom. he was going to do a thing called Twilight of the Superheroes that I guess sort of morphed into Kingdom Come. Well, I guess some people make that claim. I guess I, I don't, that's according to Mark Wade. Uh, I mean, he says that it's not necessarily true, but I guess that's that's the accusation, right? That he ripped off Alan Moore's idea. Oh, I would never say that he ripped him off, but it just seems like the idea was floating around in DC, and eventually, somebody. He, t- I think Mark Wade made his own thing, but yeah. but either way, like the idea of there being the idea of there being an ending, yeah. right? And yeah, so like, yeah, so like Alan Moore, it was Alan Moore, right? Who did um, who did um, whatever happened to the Man of Tomorrow? Yes. Right, and then Neil Gaiman did the one. Whatever happened to the Dark Knight? I don't. I don't know that one. I don't know. Um, and and like what's been interesting to see is different now in the comic book series. Every writer that any writer that's had a long tenure with a particular character, um, they're kind of given a book. Like they they end it. They do kind of an ending to their to their run, and it's a clear like demarcation. Like Jeff Johns wrote Green Lantern for like the longest time, Mm -hmm. almost 20 years. He was writing Green Lantern and I guess like 15 years. And when he left Green Lantern, he released this huge like trade paperback size comic that gave an ending to Hal Jordan's story. And it's set, you know, in a future. And so it has that same kind of like whatever happened to the man of tomorrow, like here's where the story is set to go. This is how it's going to end. Mm -hmm. You can plug in a bunch of stuff in between here and now, but that's the ending of the character, Um, which I think is really awesome. Yeah. That, you know, you have, and, and, and it gives a, you know, it's done. The story's done. Um, I think that is pretty cool, and especially when you think of like Kingdom Kung sort of being accepted as like the kind of mythical ending to DC mm-hmm. the universe and stuff. Hey, you know who is suffering the most from this sort of uh, uh, this idea that things had to exist forever and, and perpetuity? Who the Simpsons? <laughs> yes, <laughs> pull the plug. It's sad. It is. Because I'm actually, uh, I started, I, I, I listened to this uh, this new audiobook I found called um, Springfield Confidential. Mm-hmm. And it's written by, um, it's written by Mike Reese, uh, who is a writer for, for, for The Simpsons. He's been on the writing team for like years. I think like, I think it was like, he's, since like the early 90s all the way until like recently. Um, and the way he's talking about early Simpsons is so different than what today's Simpsons are. Today's Simpsons is just like, I mean, if you ask somebody like, what are the Simpsons? They'd say, oh, it's a family and they're funny, whatever. But if you ask someone like back in the nineties, what is the Simpsons? Like, oh dude, like they're, they're totally lampooning like the Cosby show or, uh, you know, it's a satire about the American family. Now it's just, it's just like a broad comedy vehicle with like celebrity voices that show up every now and then. Right. Putting yeah. like weird situations. 
Yeah, it's not a show about anything anymore. Yeah. And not like Where, in the Seinfeld yeah, like way. Said, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, like Seinfeld, I mean, because uh, Simpsons, Simpsons sort of came about in a similar time frame and with a similar approach to the American family as like Roseanne and Married with Children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which was right. sort of, let's let's show sort of the, the less positive side or the more, you know, the less, the less glossy side of the American nuclear family. Yeah. And one thing and that Mike keeps suburbia. Yeah. And one thing like Mike keeps talking about in the book is that like, you know, we pretty much exist because we just got really sick of the Cosby show. <laughs> it was just so boring and so dull. Um, and so like, what if we did a, a show about a family, uh, and, and one day, uh, you know, someone tried to build a monorail in their town, <laughs> which is the best episode, uh, a Conan O'Brien idea. Yep. Yep. Um, and it's actually, gosh, it's, it's actually a great book. I'm learning so much about like Simpsons humor and, um, the history of it. And it's, it's so great. But yeah, it's, but yeah, this, this thing of just after a while, well, and that and that becomes the question then is with these Fast and the Furious, with Star Wars, Marvel, do they just is are they, is one day just going to be like, oh, this isn't profitable and uh, profitable anymore, so we're just we're just going to not do it, and it's just going to peter out. In 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 Fast and the Furious' defense, they did say they wanted to end after ten movies. They wanted to make okay. ten movies, so it, there is an ending in mind, but they also want to do like spinoffs. But I also would argue the spinoffs like bear no semblance, no bear no semblance to Fast and the Furious anyway. So it's like it's basically just another action series. It doesn't really matter. Um, but it get but it's the same thing you're talking about though. It's just well, going. I mean, I feel like yeah, that that's that's and true. nobody's making new stuff. But that's and that's you're right. It does keep going, and that's wrong. But I feel like if you are to keep going, I do think becoming somewhat unrecognizable in a good way, not a bad way, not the way like the Simpsons are unrecognizable, unrecognizable on that. You're kind of pursuing something else, a different idea. I think that sort of re- kind of redeems it. I guess. Cause yeah, fast and furious. If it was, if it was just another movie yeah. about guys illegally racing cars. Yeah. Which you would know, get old, but they've ramped it up into, it's yeah. really absurd. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's superheroes without the capes and costumes at this point. Yeah. And Hobbs and Shaw is about like, uh, you know, a, a criminal and a cop basically be- join forces to take down a biogenetically engineered supervillain. That's what like and bears no semblance at all to what Fast and Furious is. Even as, as crazy as Fast and Furious has gotten, it's not gotten that crazy. It's like double team. With yeah. Wesley Snipes. <laughs> or no, Dennis Rodman. Dennis, right? Dennis Rodman. Rodman. Yeah, oh, I was confusing. I was confusing him with his, with the, the 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 villain, the very similar kind of like villain that Wesley Snipes played in Demolition Man. That movie, that what an artifact of '90s cinema, Dennis Rodman and Jean Claude Van Damme, mm-hmm. just made for that Friday night, just that one Friday night, <laughs> and then multiple times on Cinemax, yeah, uh, and the movie channel probably. But I um. Well, like counter to this, and I, I, mean, I mentioned this when we were talking about this a little bit um, in our in our pregame conversation today. Um, counter that to like short lived, some short lived programs that had a very clear ending and are very very beloved by people. Mm-hmm. Case in point, Neon Genesis Evangelion. Right. Oh, but then they do another series though, like another. Well. They've done, yeah, but it's the same series, just sort of updated with a couple new things. Though the uh, I can't remember the creator's name right now, but he, um, that for him, it's it's more. He was struggling with deep depression mm-hmm. while making Neon Genesis and Evangelion, which comes across quite obviously when you oh. watch Neon Genesis Evangelion. <laughs> a little bit, uh, a little bit, just a tiny bit. And he has said that because he was in such a, he was so depressed. And like he didn't even get to finish the two, like the like the final two episodes are you know there's like raw and like raw sketch work animation in it there's not even like finished animation in in, in parts of it that he you know it, it passes off artistically you know I guess it's arguable among fans but um, he sort of felt that it wasn't up to what he wanted it to be because he was so crippled by his depression mm-hmm. and so he's wanted the opportunity to revisit it to do it when he's not crippled by depression 
And so. Interesting. Yeah. Um, that's what I understand. That being said, I under, I haven't watched the new version, like the, the updated um, Evangelion, but according to the, from the, the fans, um, it is, it is not, it is, it is the inferior product that, mm-hmm. that original what, 13 episode show right. um, was about perfection for, for, for everyone. Yeah. Um, and then the two movies. Um, yeah, and, and what's funny is like it wasn't that, pe- and, and when they when he ended Neon Genesis Evangelion, and I, and I mean before he made the um, the movies, yeah, you know, people were super depressed and sending death threats and stuff. But it wasn't because it ended; it's because he ha- like how he ended it. So it almost seemed like right. they were sort of willing to accept that it's ending. Yeah, they just didn't like the ending. And when he made that movie, it was like, oh, everyone loves it, and like that's fine. That's it. You don't need to make it anymore. And I think that's. Right. That doesn't exist. <laughs> I don't think it hey, exists. I don't. Like, well, it kind of does with Game of Thrones. Yeah, people hated the ending of that of that show. Right. Mm-hmm. But I don't know that there's anyone clamoring for more Game of Thrones. Not really, uh, but we're getting it. <laughs> or how about how about I haven't watched it yet, but how about Watchmen? Oh yeah, that well, well yeah. Um, what's his face? Damon Lindelof said that he, he's just it's just the one season. He's not going to do another yeah. one. Yeah, he did a limited series and it's done. Exactly. He gets and it. He gets it. <laughs> you know what else? The most beloved story in Western civilization has a beginning, middle, end, and a bunch of other appendices and stuff. The Bible? Well, there's, well, yeah, well, I mean, there's that. Um, uh, 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 kind of the same thing. Kind of on the same page. You're with me. Uh, Lord of the Rings. Yep. Middle Earth. That has an ending. Yeah. I mean, uh, granted, you can't really keep going after J.R.R. Tolkien dies he died right yeah but, he died. his son died too yeah yeah he did die recently actually um but they 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 pretty much ended it. and then and stuff that has been kind of released since then it's just like his notes right like things that yeah he there were it's just like, yeah his son expanded some of his notes and drafts and things that he had that he had found yeah right um, So it, it was kind of it was quote-unquote milked but not like let's see how far we can go you know like just trying to get what he can get out of it. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, because um, like, I mean, oh, yeah, because like, what pretty much what Christopher Tolkien was doing was, um, the there there were stories and things that are referenced sort of in passing throughout like the Silmarillion, right. and his dad had outlined, you know, ideas about that because he was an obsessive person, right? Yeah. And so Chris Christopher decided to yeah like take the outlines and actually make stories out of them just for posterity, I guess, and mm. you know the the whole history of Middle Earth series, but. Yeah, it's it, there is no there's there is actually no way to continue the Lord of the Rings. Right. Partly due to the fact that it's a mythology about it's supposed to be like ancient human history. Like mm-hmm. it's supposed to be our earth. It's not another planet. So technically we are living the continuation of the Lord of the Rings. Right. Yeah, you know, because but and um I think it's interesting. It's it's. I mean, it's it's extra interesting when you realize, you know, what what happened recently with with Lord of the, the Lord of the Rings property before Christopher Tolkien died. Amazon bought it. Yeah. And now they're already planning their enormous Game of Thrones killing franchise based around Lord of the Rings that takes place during the. It was a second age. Yeah, during the second age. Yeah. So. It had an ending. <laughs> yeah. But like, that's the thing is like, I mean, there's, there's stories to be told within that time frame, mm-hmm. you know, and that's kind of when Christopher Tolkien was, those are the sort of the stories he was writing. Right. Were set around that time. But, um, but yeah, it's, but yeah, again, though, it's, it's, it's this tendency for us to try to find, to take these beloved, to take like a beloved story And to just, yeah, to milk it, to just stretch it thin and just keep adapting the hell out of it or remixing it or rebooting it or whatever. And it is the, and this is where we get to the real, the real difficult part of all this. And that is, it's so, it's such evidence of the absolute worst parts of capitalism. Yeah. Because capitalism does not like risk right 
It does not like innovation. It likes a sure thing. And so now that all of these things have become corporate, you know, you know, bio, you know, they've just become, you know, lines on a, on a budget sheet, Mm -hmm. you know, they're just investments. It's let's make it, let's figure out how we can formulize it and just package it and sell it to the people so that it, it gets, you know, gets them in the theater and we make a bunch of money. Yeah. And it, it, it kind of makes me worry. And like, I'm not trying to sound like an, an alarmist, but it does kind of concern me how it affects the culture in, in large. And, and, and yeah. uh, like, like I said, the, it's become mainstream now to have sort of these properties go into perpetuity and it, and it affects the way people, I think it ultimately affects the way people consume media and their overall like media literacy. Because well, now I, you have like a more like, and, and, and you might call me an alarmist here, but I think there is a different way. Like I think nerds consume media very differently from like the rest of the world consumes media. Or like like a, like an expert consumes media, and I feel like the the way that a nerd would consume media is what's becoming mainstream, and it's and it's affecting how we all our relationship with art, basically. Right, it's all fan service. Yeah, I yes. I um, but I'm wondering about how this stuff impacts like us as humans, like spiritually, morally. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, because like. I mean, looking at internet discourse, you know, we talked, you know, we talked a little bit at the beginning of this. I, I, somewhere I read, I think it was a cracked article several years ago that made a really good point that our approach to our ideological opponents, on, especially because of the, the internet, we treat them like video game <laughs> yeah. enemies. Like we, 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 so many people think of it in terms of like video games. It's almost like, I just want you to go away. But it's like, you can't, you can't make that thing go away. It never goes away. You you have to learn to deal with it. You know, you can't you can't just say like, all right, you know, like for instance, it's that great shutdown that you hear that you hear people on the right make, which was you hear and you hear Trump say it all the time. The American people have spoken and you know, the Democrats have basically refused to accept that the American people spoke, you know, spoken in voting me into office and therefore there's a sense that because I you know, won, I won and therefore, because I won, you should just shut up because we won. Right. Well, first of all, it ignores the fact that the American people did not unanimously speak. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, just because you inched over the majority line does not that, – that, 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 that's not a true statement to say the American people spoke. Some American people spoke. <laughs> there was a ch- significant chunk of the, other, of the other part of the American people who did not speak – and you still have to govern them, too, and govern for them, too. And that's the thing our politicians don't seem to understand. And this is where I get concerned around extremist views, is that you can't think that, oh, because we won, the other side disappears and we can just silence them, make them, you know, shut them up, mute them, whatever. They're always going to be there. And that doesn't endorse them or platform them. But it does mean we have to learn to live somehow yeah. and recognize that they will come back. Um, and I worry – I worry – so that's the way I think some ways video game thinking has impacted a lot of people. And I wonder about – I mean what do, you, what do you think? I mean do you think there are ways in which this sort of ongoing storytelling season after season approach to things is affecting us – spiritually politically morally i mean I, I can see how election cycles are treated like this oh yeah i mean, well, just the news another season the news yeah like yeah i, I mean I, I can't even watch like i don't know i think i always be talking in the last episode but like i can't watch cable news anymore because it's just well, an ongoing is... attempt to make me angry right and this is actually a really good example of what we we're talking about is that the way the news does things is that they hammer a story hammer a story hammer a story until the next big st- Right. peters away yeah so like right now everything is you, know, you go on you go like i mean for months right it was just trump this trump that impeachment this impeachment that and then suddenly now it's coronavirus it's covid and Primaries. biden yeah yeah biden. um you know so you know but it's pretty much all like covid right now right yeah, yeah. 
you know, and then in what three weeks, something new will come along and that'll be the only thing that we hear about. Right. Cause they only keep about three stories in the headlines at any given point. Yeah. Um, but like, okay, so that's media. That's, that's our politics. What do you think about like morally and spiritually? The, the, the idea that, um, what we consume should take over our lives instead of enrich it. Here's yes. Control here's, lives here's, instead of being just something we engage in every now, every now and then. But you think it should control us? No, 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 no. no. Oh, gotcha. Okay. I say, dude, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, 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 no. no, I, here's, here's my little theory. So in my line of work, um, you know, what we're, what, what was you know, one of the great growing concerns in Christianity in the West is that, you know, our numbers are diminishing and there's a couple of ways in which people have been interpreting this. The, 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 the sort of far right fundamentalist type evangelical type mm -hmm. Christians are going to say, you know, it's, it's because, you know, media, they're going to blame all this stuff trying to make, it makes Christianity look bad and politicians, you know, the, the, the leftist politicians are trying to, you know, sub, you know, diminish it and they're putting, you know, this, that, or whatever in front of it. And so people are leaving the church because they're sort of being deceived away from it or whatever. Um, the, the other bit of data then, of course, and you have the other side of it is this sense that, oh, we're not relevant enough. And so we need to be more relevant to the society and to the culture. And we need to change our traditions and beliefs and other things in order to accommodate the culture, because then they'll then they'll come beating down the doors for the for the church, which neither of things are true. And the result is, you know, is, is not happening. The, 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 the other way of interpreting the data that I've seen, is, and this is the way that I think is actually true, is that actually people are more honest and that what we're seeing in regards to religious adherence, particularly among Christians, is that the actual percentage of people who really actually believe this stuff was never really much more than what we're seeing. It's just that now they're they feel more honest to be able to say that they're not Christians anymore, mm -hmm. that there was more of a social obligation to have to go to church and have to participate in this stuff. Um, so that's actually not their religion anymore. And so what I think is, is because we have a society now where people who were never really religious and are now being honest about that and not going to church just because that's what the, what's expected of them. Um, what's what I think has effectively happened is that these things have become their religion and that when you have some, I mean, look at what they've done. What, I mean, there's no difference in, in shaming and bullying Kelly Marie Tran off of Instagram than there was yelling harlot and whore you're seducing me yeah. to adulterous women and you know putting him in the stocks or whatever like there's really no difference to that I mean you see this sort of Puritan impulse coming out of these people and and so I think that what we're actually seeing is religious fundamentalism like but it's applied to ghostbusters for some stupid reason i think you're right on the fundamentalism part yeah yeah um and so i think it's just religious fundamentalism in a new in a new guise mm -hmm. um it's you know it's it's not happening in the church anymore i mean it's still happening in the church i shouldn't say that but it's it's more publicly happening in like fandom circles yeah and i feel like we might be kind of like skirting on the edge of the things like Noam Chomsky talks about in Manufacturing Consent, a book I, I really need to read, apparently. I don't know if you've heard of that book. I mean, I know no Ch I know Noam Chomsky mostly through his like his like linguistics work. Yeah. Not his politics, but yeah. He wrote this he wrote this book called Manufacturing Consent and it's apparently like huge about I mean it, it's it's all about like how we let media sort of create our, our, our narrative. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I don't know. I need to read it. Maybe I'm, when I'm done with my Simpsons book, I can read Noam Chomsky. There you go. <laughs> um, so no, that 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 is interesting. Kind of, and I and I have, I haven't quite applied that. I haven't quite applied that myself to fandom, but I definitely, I definitely I have applied it to politics. Uh, well, not just politics, but the kind of the the, the woke scolds as we call them. Uh, you know, the people that yell at you for liking Chinatown. 
to me, they're no different from like a Calvinist. <laughs> right. Exactly. I think they're in good company, really. <laughs> no, totally. No, absolutely. You're absolutely right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think really what it comes down to, maybe the, maybe the, the thing is, is that like, you know, toxic fandom, like that's the umbrella category and it manifests because you've turned your religion into your fandom or you've turned your political affiliation into your fandom. And so you're letting your entire identity be shaped by it. And it's really not about the ideas or the truths behind it. It's about something else. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, like there's a whole, there's a whole, there's a whole segment of Bernie Sanders supporters who clearly have no idea what his platform is. They just see him as a disruptive figure. Like these are the same geniuses that because Bernie didn't win the nomination in 2016, they went and voted for Trump. When I found out about that, I was like, these are, these people are complete opposites. How can you do that? Yeah. But if all you look for is, oh, we think this is somebody who's going to break something, then okay, I can see where, where, where you're coming from. But that's not why you vote for people. Mm -hmm. Um, but again, like I think again, it's that it's that fandom thing. It's not it's it's about taking from it something about yourself rather than understanding what it's actually about. Right. And so I guess like when when you've made Luke Skywalker into your messiah and you see a movie where that humanizes him. That humanizes him, you've lost your god. Right. And so now all you want is to, you know, burn the heretics. Yeah, and that's and that's what I'm not what I'm saying. When when media becomes more about familiarity, something you kind of curl up to to get away from the real world, as opposed to letting it enrich your life, letting it, you know, maybe give you some pointers on how to take life on. You see, it's like. You know, I Luke Skywalker is the the guy in the black suit with the green lightsaber, and that's who he'll always be to me. And if there's anything else, you know, that's you're like taking my blankie away. Right, right. And 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 again, this same logic can be applied to religion. Yeah. Right. I mean, think about how many people. I mean, look at the language we talk about. Like, oh, I'm looking for a church that feeds me. But that's not why you go to church. Mm -hmm. It's actually not about you at all. Right. Worship worship is about God, not about you. And, and so you get that same kind of thing, like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm using this as my security blanket. My religion is my security blanket. Now I've got these ideas of what this relig what religion is supposed to be. What do you mean to tell me that gay people can get married? The, the security blanket says that that can't happen. Right, yeah. Right? You, we, you know, it, it's, it, so I, th I think this logic applies in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and the stakes are equally high to the person who's that fanaticized by something. Right. Yeah. So, uh, what do we do, Chuck? How do we, how do we end? Let's, let's, uh, I don't know. How do we, are you, what do you want to, you want to like, what's, what, what do we offer to people? Yeah. Uh, how do, how do we get DC to stop making comic books? I don't know that DC needs to stop making comic books. <laughs> I mean, wouldn't it be great? But maybe they like... could, maybe they could stop making Batman. Wouldn't that be Maybe, interesting? I mean, what, 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 would it, what would people do? Like, if, if DC was like, we're just going to stop making Batman. And Warner Brothers said, yeah, we're not going to make any more Batman movies either. It's Batman's done. Yeah. I, I've actually thought about, I thought about this a few years ago when um, around the time that they were doing, uh, when they were going to do the New 52 initiative. Yeah. I kind of had this thought of, what if they're building toward like a complete line-wide ending? I mean, I think people what should. I think. Old move. I think that should be the new trend: ending stuff. <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. Uh, like just doing radical things. Like I don't know. Can, can you imagine? Where did I read this? Because I'm kind of on my Simpsons kick. And like, you know, I don't know anybody who watches The Simpsons. Uh, I certainly I, don't. I don't think anyone actually does. Yeah, I'm kind of wondering. Who, is, is there anyone out there who still watches The Simpsons? Like, oh, I got the new Simpsons on. I got to watch it. I don't think I've said that since I was like 14. Um, yeah, actually, I want to know. That. I want if you are one of those, please let us know. I, I, we don't want to make fun of you. We just act <laughs> genuinely curious. <laughs> but if you told me right now that like, okay, uh, next season The Simpsons is going to be the last season, and we got some plans for it, 
I tune in. I at least watch the first episode. Totally. <laughs> and 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 I think and if you told me like we're that we're not even last season. If you're like the the last episode of The Simpsons is airing next week, yeah, I would. I mean, I'm going to be there live. Yeah, like, I'm going to yeah. turn the TV on and actually change the channel to the channel to Fox. Mm-hmm. It's still on Fox, right? That's <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, this is a good point, right? TV, TV generally at some point has endings. Yeah. Right. There's ser- there there is a series finale, and it's always a big deal mm-hmm. when there's a series finale. Oh yeah. And that's like the one. That's like the one area where they do that, but they don't. They don't really do it with movies, right? Like you have an ending, but it's it's not really. It's a sort of a break, and then we're gonna continue it some other way. Well, yeah, or... like, like franchise movies. Yeah, they're they're always yeah. there's, there's always an exit. Like yeah, yeah. I it would be interesting if they actually did. Like like yeah, ending things would be would be. Well, I mean, think about think about um, when Deathly Hollows came out. Oh yeah, as a book, how. What a big deal that was. I mean, honestly, it's kind of good business sense to have an ending mm-hmm. because, you know, it draws people in. Um, yeah. I mean, could you let's just take a moment and just imagine <laughs> if DC and like announced their like their like big summer event is this is the end of DC. This is the end of DC. And that they've been actually working on like they're, and they're and they're still going to publish comics. So, like they're not going to shutter as a company. Like they're still going to publish comics, but they're just going to end Superman, Wonder Woman, Batman, all of that. Mm-hmm. They're just going to end it. That'd be and awesome. And they're and they're like and they're like working on new characters, new storylines. They're going to do something completely new. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And just to start from the ground up and see if they can do it. It'll never happen. Never. It would never happen. Never. <laughs> but wouldn't it be awesome? Yeah. Star Trek The Next Generation, the writers said – I watched an episode recently that I'd never seen before. It was an episode where um, – it was in the, se- in the seventh season. It was where Jordy LaForge um, loses his mother. Mm-hmm. Um, and reading the Memory Alpha entry about this, the writer's room said that was the episode when they realized they needed to end The Next Generation – that they realized they had run out of ideas. He said, oh, this is what we're doing now. Jordy's mom. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everyone's, they, they, everyone's parents of the main crew have shown up on the show. And so Jordy right. was the last one. Like this is, we've run out of ideas. This right. is where, this is where we are. And because of that, they gave us easily the strongest series finale. Like one of the song is one of the strongest series finales of any television show. Which is all good things. The last episode of Star Trek: The Next Generation. I still haven't seen. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, dude. I'm trying. To, I'm still trying to work my way through Next Generation. <laughs> See, the thing for I found with Next Generation because it it's not serial. Like I can just watch it piecemeal. Yeah, uh, yeah, but I've never really experienced it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I, I that I I experienced it piecemeal growing up. So I'm like, I'm trying to watch it as like beginning to end. It's a new I mean, if you want to do it, it, but if you want to do it, it's it's rough. <laughs> But if you want to do it right, man, you have to watch it one day a week <laughs> and then, you know, take summer breaks. So like when when Locuta shows up on that view screen, you're like, all right, well, summer breaks here and I got to wait <laughs> three months before I can find out what happens. Yeah. And then That's... you got to also like interrupt it for like baseball games. And yeah. Hey, you know, you know who did try to come back and just sort of go back to the status quo where like they just did. They just kind of like put it back in that time capsule, and it's like, okay, we're going back, we're bringing everything back, and it's going to be exactly the same. We're not going to change a, 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 a damn thing. It's going to be the exact same show you remember, and it did not work at all. X Files. I didn't watch the new X Files. It was. I mean, that's what they did. Like there was no change in the status quo. It was as if like the. <laughs> I mean, they acknowledged that everything that happened years ago, of course, but it's right. still. Scully, Mulder, FBI, weird cases each episode. With that sort of aliens taking over the world myth arc that doesn't make any sense. I see. I don't know. I've I actually was. I've never. I've never really watched X Files. Yeah, and it wasn't good. Well, I, that, I know that, but it, it it wasn't good. I mean, we tried to fool ourselves that it was good because because that's the thing. It was very familiar. It's extremely familiar. It was like. Mm-hmm. I remember. I remember watching that episode that when it came back. I was like, "It's like it never left," 
And that's what everybody was saying. It was like, and then like when she got to the end of the of that season, it was like, oh no, it's like it never left. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that's a bad thing. Yeah, the familiarity like, is a bad thing. Right, and like, p- like Picard. Okay, so we'll we'll talk about Picard real quick. We can end on this. Yeah, here's a show that's taken a character that's very beloved mm-hmm. and put him in a completely new circumstance. Yeah. He's not in Starfleet. Starfleet is a mess. The future is a darker future, which is consistent with everything that's come before it. Yeah. And because of that, it feels new and fresh. It doesn't just feel like the continuations of the next generation. Right. It it feels like it's a it's that that's a good way of doing something. If you're going to do something new, you acknowledge that something has ended. But here's a, here's something fresh and new that we can take with this with this person. Right. Um, and it doesn't feel like it's beating something to death. Even though that being said, I also, if we had never gotten Picard, that'd been fine too. Mm-hmm. Like my life wasn't missing it. Right. Um, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice bonus. It's a nice bonus, but to get angry about it is the thing I don't understand. Yeah. I know, and that's 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 kind of some of the criticism I saw that you were talking about how oh it's making it too cool for school, but like I didn't see it as that as someone who who uh, subjected themselves to nearly thirty hours of the next generation and to watch Picard it was like a a bottle of sprig water like I was like oh oh they're trying to make it good <laughs> it's not wall to wall carpet with a ficus in the corner oh geez it's real art design yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and in a way that like acknowledged the past, like Data's in his old uniforms and yeah, all weird. that, huh? It, he, he, I mean, admittedly, looked kind of looked weird, but you would be a little past it. It's Star Trek. It's Star Trek, right? <laughs> Things are gonna be um, weird. Yeah, but um, yeah, I but again, again, like okay, so you don't like it, you you don't have to watch it. Yeah. And I guess that's the other thing, too, about this, and that's where he gets into this sort of religious fanaticism kind of thing, is that you feel an obligation to participate, watch, consume, all of that. Yeah. And I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I get that. One time I was, at, I was at Home Depot about two years ago, and... There was some big football game happening. I can't remember what it was. It wasn't like the Super Bowl, but it was close. Okay. And Ken and I were buying it. We were getting something for the house. And in comes this, clearly, like, a couple and then the, the either the dude's brother or, like, weirdo friend who hangs out with them. But this guy came in, and he was, he was, you know... He was clearly, you know, a manly man kind of man, but, you know, like kind of pudgy and, you know, kind of, you know. But anyway, he just sort of looked typical. He was a basic. The, the, the man version of a basic. He's a basic man. Basic okay. dude. All right. Uh, a basic bro. Okay. But he had whatever football team it was. I think it was the Cowboys. And I'm sorry, but because I know you're – but I, I, it might have been the Cowboys. I don't remember. But, can't, but JP, he had like – the the team's hat on his head. Mm-hmm. He had two like handkerchiefs tied to his belt loops on his pants, hanging. He had a t-shirt on of the team, but with like the sleeves cut off. And then I think he even had, had like sweatbands in the like colors of the team. And I remember him walking in, and I'm like, okay. And he's like carefully adjusting the handkerchiefs to like make sure that they're like out. And they look good and all of that. And I just I looked at this guy for a while and I was just like, I don't understand what is happening. How does your identity get wrapped up into a sports team like that? I don't understand it. But then I started to think about I have a shelf of Godzilla toys yeah. in my office and a bunch of Godzilla DVDs and, you know, and there's just sort of like when when the new Godzilla movie comes out, I'm like, I gotta see it opening day. 
why? So it's it's in there. It's in all of us mm-hmm. to be like this. And it's just a very interesting part of the human psyche and the human condition. Right. And I don't fully understand it. <laughs> I don't think. But I, I do know that if you don't if you don't investigate it, very bad things can happen. <laughs> yeah, that's true. There, I think there probably will be will come a time in your fandom where you're like, should I step away from this? Because I've been saying that a lot about Star Wars. Like a lot. Probably about 20 years too late. But <laughs> they brought it back. What was I supposed to do? <laughs> you know? It's like, yeah, you said, mean, like, gonna... it's like you said, they brought it back. I, I, I mean, when, when they brought Star Wars back, I didn't really care about Star Wars anymore. It was three great films to me that I, that I treasured as cinema. Not as fandom. I said, yeah, and then it came yeah. out. I was like, okay, we're back, baby. <laughs> and now it's like a fandom, you know. It's not, but but thank God for like Ryan Johnson, you know. Yeah. Well, here's I, here's the thing about I I was with you on that. I was with you on that about Star Wars. But then my boys came along. <laughs> Your boys, and they are obsessed. Oh yeah. 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 With Star Wars. Mm-hmm. And so it's become a whole different thing for me now because it's something that I share with my kids in. Right, yeah. And, like, it gets back to that thing we talked I, we talked about this early on in this show. But, like, when The Force Awakens came out, like, and I mean this show, like, not this episode, but, like, when we started the podcast, yeah. um, was that picture that was on the Palm, the Palm Beach Post when the toys for Force Awakens came out. Oh, yeah. And it was just a whole aisle of like white dudes with beards yeah. like <laughs> that are our age that look just like you and I right now, you know, buying toys and holding them and all that. And there was this whole thing about like kids couldn't find the figures they wanted. Right. And then SNL did a great sketch about it. Huh? SNL oh yeah. 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 That's right. They did. And I, and I just, I, I think about that cause like I'm, I'm with my boys now and I'm like, this is what this is for. Yeah. This is for children. Mm-hmm. You know, That's what George Lucas has been saying for years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for years. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, I've got, you know, I've got a couple of, you know, I've got a couple of collectible, you know, I've got like Godzilla toys and stuff that are very collectible to me. But you know what? Like, I let my kids play with them when they're in my office. And I've got, I've got a, I've got a Lego A Wing on my bookshelf that I still need to take with me. Um, and I bought it and built it. It's like one of like my kind of premium Lego kits. I bought it and built it because I was, I told I told Charlie and Ford, I said, when I was a kid, I always wanted an A-Wing toy. Mm-hmm. And when I was a kid, they didn't make them. Like, you could only buy them. If you found them, you only found them in, like, collectible stores. And they were very expensive. Yeah. And so I never got an A-Wing. And so I bought this Lego set because I had the money to buy it. And I was like, and I wanted to, I wanted to have, a, I wanted to have an A-Wing because I always wanted one as a kid. Right. But, like, I fully plan on, because when we get to Hawaii, they, they won't have most of their toys. Mm-hmm. So, like, I'm, I think I'm going to bring this with me in my carry in my in my pack luggage and let them play with the a-wing when we get to when we get to our house in hawaii because it's for children yeah <laughs> right okay well so, so how, yeah, do, how, how do we how do we end this episode <laughs> we just end <laughs> the, the sopranos <laughs> go to black exactly <laughs> cool well i think that's a good that is a good place to end it actually i think that is good. yeah yeah. yeah, and uh, we're I mean, actually we're just getting in the show. We're done. Uh, Masters of Divinity is over. <laughs> this, that would be that. I mean, I mean, if anything, that would be a good way to to end it to talk about endings. Like, I'm I'm pretty sure people are listening to this. Like, are, are, what are they trying to tell us right now? <laughs> and in the end, <laughs> the love you made. I don't know. I think I I think this podcast might go into perpetuity. I think <laughs> I think it's it's possible. Until the 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 cooling the 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 sun, red. the heat death of the, the heat death of the universe, the heat death of the universe. Yeah, that's. I I, uh, I the thing is though we're not trying to tell a story here. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> we're just hanging out. Exactly. And we're, we're offering. Ju- and, yeah, and we're we're glad you're you're hanging out with us, listening to yes. us ramble and liking our our stuff and subscribing to it. And some of us, some of you actually giving us money. Yeah, which we appreciate. Um, and uh, leaving reviews, do all of that. Do all of that. We appreciate it. And uh, yes, we'll, we'll 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 get back to our usual selves soon. <laughs> I know we've been saying that for a while. <laughs> yeah. Well, I will say this: that um, we can go ahead and let the listeners know for sure things are going to be a little bit intermittent 
um, yeah. because of the fact that I am relocating to the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Right. Um, and so I will be leaving. So, like, I mean, we might be able to record next week. Um, yeah. And then that weekend I will be I will be heading over to the West Coast to be with my in-laws. And then we're going to do a Disney trip. And then we're flying out to Hawaii and then uh, shortly after I arrive there, we'll be settling in and then we're going to have Holy Week, you know, so it might it might be like three or four weeks before. Yeah. After that, that I'll fully be able to commit to recording. But who knows? And in that time, we should probably in that time, we'll probably start planning out what uh, the future of the show is going to be like and uh, how, how well, we talk- not just logistics, but also like we're talking about, you know, we're, we're, gonna, we're talking about changing things up because we don't want to just. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, oh God, I'm so tired. I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, uh, we're talking about sort of changing the show because change is good, especially when you have something that just kind of keeps going, uh, as we've talked about in this episode, that's, that's heavy handedly hinting at, as I keep rambling and saying words that are coming out of my mouth, you're supposed to stop me when I do this and you're just letting me go on and on and He's just not gonna not gonna say anything, not gonna interject at all, and then just gonna keep going. Well, you're just... not really giving me a breath to even jump in. <laughs> there it is. And 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 on that note, thank okay. you so much for listening and watching. Join us again next time. Good journey. Mahalo and good journey. Thank you, Kenan.